In this module, we will talk about the history of risk assessment in the Federal Air Toxics Program. I will highlight some of the more important air pollution legislation and how it has evolved over the years. We will focus on how the federal government became involved in air pollution in the first place, why air toxics were introduced in the 1970 Clean Air Amendment, why the 1970 provisions were so hard to implement, and how the 1990 amendments changed things for the better. This will bring us up to date, legislatively speaking, on why we conduct air toxics risk assessments today. Based on growing concerns on the air quality, Congress passed the 1963 Clean Air Act, which helped strengthen research programs for the prevention and reduction of air pollution. This original Clean Air Act has been amended several times, including in 1970 and in 1990. The 1970 Clean Air Act established Section 112 to deal with air pollutants considered toxic and to set emission standards for those pollutants. The 1970 amendments distinguished air toxics, also called hazardous air pollutants, or HAPs, from criteria pollutants, such as particulate matter and ozone. HAPs were characterized as chemicals which may be reasonably anticipated to cause adverse effects. The 1970 Act instructed EPA to identify HAPs based on limited criteria, which tended to focus on cancer as the health endpoint of concern, and to regulate their emissions with an ample margin of safety, using a process that allowed for public comment in a period of approximately one year. EPA had problems implementing these directives for obvious timing reasons. An added problem was trying to clarify what the phrase ample margin of safety meant. This is a policy issue that EPA wrestled with for a long time. The issue of what constitutes an ample margin of safety came to a head when EPA tried to regulate a chemical called vinyl chloride. This chemical is the main component of PVC pipes and a lot of plastics. We use PVC in a variety of ways. For example, almost any home you visit these days has PVC pipes and a good deal of other PVC plastic items. So here EPA was faced with a conundrum. EPA was required by law to regulate a chemical for which there appears to be no safe level of exposure and regulate that chemical to provide an ample margin of safety for people and the chemical is important to our economy and to people. To make a long story short, EPA set the standard for vinyl chloride as best as they could under the circumstances. But the National Resource Defense Council did not agree and sued the agency, saying that EPA set the standards based on issues of technology and cost rather than on health concerns and that the act does not allow for that. Instead, the National Resource Defense Council said EPA was required to base the regulation on human health, and the agency failed to do that. The parties ended up in court, and the council won. To address the issue of setting a rule on ample margin of safety, where there may not be risk-free level of exposure, the District of Columbia Circuit Court suggested the EPA follow a two-step process. Step one, Define what we mean by safe and establish a process to determine what that safe level is for an air pollutant. The court defines safe as not necessarily being risk-free. So the court morphed this definition of safe into meaning an acceptable level of risk given a particular activity. The activity in this case is emission of HAPs. This decision was based on human health the court made other important points. One, there will be always uncertainty in making the decision of what is acceptable. Two, the agency should have a fair amount of discretion in determining what acceptable risk is. In step two, we define what we mean by ample margin of safety, and based on that, we come up with a process for setting the standard. In this second step, we can consider technological feasibility and cost. The first opportunity EPA had to apply the logic outlined in the ruling was a 1989 emission standard for benzene. 
Interestingly, the agency did not apply this logic to the vinyl chloride standard because the 1990 amendments to the act were passed before EPA could go back and revisit the vinyl chloride and several other standards. The 1990 amendments changed how we do things, but we'll get to that in a minute. EPA said in the benzene rule that if a person's individual cancer risk is 100 in a million or higher, that is considered too high, and we need to reduce those risks no matter what the cost. What we're saying here is that risk is not acceptable. If risk to an individual is less than one in a million, then we're not going to do anything. Here, what we're saying is that the level to which we're exposed is acceptable in terms of risk. In fact, it's so safe that we will say that it is safe with an ample margin of safety. Bottom line, we're not worried about risks less than one in a million. Now, if the risk to a person is between one in a million and a hundred in a million, we're going to look further into it to see how expensive it is to fix the problem and to see what we can possibly do to reduce those risks. So to summarize, we first decide what is safe, considering health effects only. Then we determine what is an ample margin of safety, considering costs and technological feasibility. You can imagine the slow progress the agency could make in protecting public health under, under this approach. First, EPA had to identify the HAPs one by one. Then they had to regulate based on the ample margin of safety outlined in the benzene rule. The agency was poised for failure. Fortunately, Congress recognized this problem and passed a new set of amendments to the act that was signed into law in 1990. The 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act is the current law under which we work. The air toxics provisions of 1970 said EPA should regulate individual pollutants based on human health effects only. The 1990 amendments changed that concept drastically. First, the new act provided a specific list of chemicals for regulation. This list of HAPs can be modified by addition or removal based on specific criteria. In fact, two compounds have been removed from the HAPS list since 1990, making it a total of 187 HAPS in the current list. The new amendment said EPA was first to regulate emissions from source categories. Source categories are basically groups of sources that emit similar chemicals. EPA is to regulate source categories not on individual pollutants, but on all the HAPs that come out of a source category. The amendment changed how EPA will regulate. No longer is the agency to regulate only on health, but also on available technology. This technology focus creates the Maximum Achievable Control Technology, or MACT, program. Congress then said to revisit the source categories later and assess the risks remaining after the MAC standards were met, also called residual risks. And this leads us to the residual risk requirements of the 1990 amendments. For residual risks, the Congress mandated that EPA assess risk from stationary sources that emit air toxics after technology-based MAC standards are in place. EPA is to set additional standards if those MAC standards do not protect the public health with an ample margin of safety. The agency is also to set additional standards if necessary to prevent adverse environmental effects. In addition to further regulating stationary sources, Congress also provided EPA with authority to study and reduce risks in urban areas. It is because of these provisions that today we look at air toxics from a risk-based perspective. So, where are we now? We came from a time where there were no law regarding air toxics to 1970, an air toxics provision which was impossibly difficult to implement, to 1990, a new provision designed to give us time to hone our risk assessment methods, to today, where we're conducting and reviewing source-specific risk assessments and community-level risk assessments.